All right. Now I'm going to rewind to the past because everybody needs to hear this anyway. Now, remember, we go back all the way to the beginning of World War II. From World War II, that's when the entire world has changed. Uh, globaliz globalization went full way under power. Now, there were some weird, shady things going on in World War II that even unbelievers, and I'm talking about lost, uh, unsaved historians, admitted that the United States government made some bad decisions where they could have avoided Pearl Harbor attack. That was a typical excuse why we went to World War II. Uh, they also mentioned that we could have avoided dropping the atomic bomb, etc. So there's a lot of these weird incidents when you study behind the scenes of what our government did. It was during World War II that they could have avoided a lot of catastrophe, the United States of America. However, they got involved. Usually in every catastrophe, there is a profit after that, especially wars. That's important to understand. If you want an economy that will continue on, a society that will continue on, you need catastrophes. Because what you need to do is basically give a, uh, wipe everything clean, give a clean slate to start with. So that's important to understand. Uh, even lost people will admit that when they talk about World War II, the wars that it just boosted the economy, it just pretty much saved the economy, so to speak. Got rid of a lot of overpopulation issues too, if you know what I mean. So catastrophes are important to start a clean slate with everything. Fresh start in government, everybody rigorously working hard when you're starting a new society, new function. So because of a catastrophe, that's why it starts to go uphill. And then ever since the end of World War II and during the Cold, Cold War era, we thought that we were invincible. The two powers that came out winners, remember, are the United States of America and during that time what is known as the Soviet Union. Now it's Russia, but uh, they're still communist in my opinion, the way they run things. But anyway, the point is, is, during that time, we thought that we were pretty much invincible, that we we're under prosperity. That's because we went through a huge worldwide catastrophe. That's very important. Every historical timeline, I challenge you, the beginning of a prosperous civilization starts because of conquest. Somebody has to suffer first. Same thing like our salvation. The only way you can attain a salvation like this is because a high holy being had to suffer a really high cost. Now, that's an inevitable thing that I preached last Sunday, right? I think people do not understand this. If you're going to reap some kind of huge benefit, enjoy prosperity or anything in life, it's inevitable payday has to come. So if you're enjoying anything uh, right now, it's not because of your hard-working efforts. It's because of somebody who suffered before you and then you're reaping the consequences, rewards of it. I mean, what you're reaping right now, you're enjoying, it's hitting the uh, debt ceiling. So now we're suffering ever since three years ago, right? And then they keep saying in every secular college class, it's on you guys, the next generation, to take care of things. Why? Because those older generations were living high on the hog that time. Yes, yes. So it's not unfair now to the next generations where they have to pick up uh, slack and save the next generations. See, you've got to realize this. Anyone eating up the fruits, then uh, there's payday is going to happen. That's why World War II is crucial so that society can enjoy their prosperity later on. Now, remember what I told you before, because since shady things are going on behind the scenes with our government, with higher ups, with elites, where they could have avoided the catastrophe, it's like as if they allowed it to happen or they deliberately want it to happen. But either or, the point is, it's their fault. They could have avoided the catastrophe, but they didn't. So they're in big trouble, especially once we hit 9-11. But anyway, the point is this, is that if it is true, and we've seen it through our history, and what I've taught in this class and to this church is that the devil's people or globalists or elites, it's important for them that 
there must be suffering or catastrophes so that they can uh, reap rewards or riches. That's the thing with uh, some occultic societies. The phoenix bird is prized to them. Basically, that something must die in order for something to have you life. But you notice how they're stealing from biblical principles about being born again from death, right? See, so they're grabbing, the devil is grabbing everything from the Bible. But in our history, I've shown you that the Illuminati is a real organization. For some of you who thought that was a fairy tale, no, that's actually historical. Even historians admit that. What's fictional, they'll say, is today that they, uh, that they exist or they don't exist. But the point is, during the birth of America, Illuminati was a real organization. But then they disappeared because uh, the people saw them as a threat. So then, all of a sudden, you see some of the people who, who were connected to the schools with the Illuminati, they were infiltrating uh, really higher up schools, and then you see those graduates entering Skull and Bones. And this was during the Great Awakening revivals that time. But then they were doing it in secret. Then you hear about Round Table. So then Round Table, that's where they succeeded. Round Table was during the time of World War I. That was when your King James Bible was thrown out and the Revised Version came in. So coincidentally at that timing, or it was God ordained, all right, which I believe it is, if you reject that book, then God's going to reject you. God will turn you over to the wolves. God will turn you over to the devil's uh, wolves, the devil's elites who are hungry to feast on the people, yeah. if you know what I mean. So we are living in those times. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> so during the time of World War I, that's where they succeeded with the round table. The people who are in charge of round table, uh, they, those same elites who joined the round table, you see them in charge uh, and having connections to Rockefellers and then the Chase Bank and CFR. So today's globalist organizations that you hear, a lot of people who claim themselves to be truthers don't even know their history. They don't go way back. It goes all the way back to Round Table. But even more than that, it goes, can go back to Skull and Bones, back to Illuminati, which was during, the, and it can go even back to the beginning of America. So I've shown you from history. I've shown you from history. They only show you today's globalists, but you have to look at historically where they come from. Uh, if you believe there is a devil and the devil used whatever elites he can find in any uh, historical era, then it's going to make sense to you. Okay, that's important to keep in mind. Now, anyway, I sum up all of that for this. It's important to understand then that the... Uh, that the elites or the globalists are responsible for the catastrophes that happen and for the prosperity. Why? Because if you're a globalist, if you're a leader, if you're a leader in charge of any kingdom, how would you want your society to thrive? How would you want it to last for the next generations, your kingdom to be prosperous? Something must suffer, see? There must be a catastrophe. Something, some big event must occur so that their kingdom can thrive. That's important to understand. Now, some of you, if you don't think that deep, then, you know, you've been pretty much programmed to TV nowadays, you know, so you don't, you're not really thinking. But if you're a king in charge of a kingdom, that's what you're supposed to go for. All right, you take advantage of suffering, of catastrophes, utilize that for more power, more control or prosperity. That's important to keep in mind. You got to think about the past history of dictators and conquerors, how they were able to rule over the world, how they were able to have prosperous kingdoms, even up to Adolf Hitler that time. Remember, why did the Nazi uh, kingdom was conquering and they were winning? They were winning at the beginning. You know how that happened? Because of a catastrophe at the beginning, a huge catastrophe where Germany was in anger, in depression, suffering, the economy was falling apart. They wanted a world leader mm -hmm. Come on. See? to save them out of the mess. That's why Hitler and his Nazi party, they thrived. Their kingdom was booming. Yeah. Their kingdom was booming that time. So study any world leader or dictator. 
Catastrophes are important to have more control. Even lost people, Democrats, okay, I'm talking about liberals, they'll even admit this, that during this time when 9-11 hit, George Bush would not have been president had it not been 9-11 and the events surrounding that. They all even say that, the liberals. See, so in, in everybody's mind, they know this. To gain more power, you, catastrophes are important to control people. Okay? That's important to keep in mind. All right? The devil knows that too. When you're, uh, when you're in need, when you're in catastrophe, and then if you're not a safe Christian, where are you going to turn to? You'll turn to anything that the devil gives to you to find your peace, to get your fulfillment. See, so that's a part of human nature. That's part of history, psychology, etc. It's, it's an inevitable thing that I see within our human nature. Okay, so we are now covering the 90s and the 2000s. That's where we've hit. 90s and 2000s, we're hitting here now. So the timeline of World War II, then from World War II, we can go from 40s to 50s. Uh, to the 80s here, we can say. It was during this era that they were living high in prosperity. Then in 90s, where things were really going very well, then when 2000s got uh, hit, just strange little catastrophes started happening more and more. And then it just started to thrust downhill during 90s and 2000s. Okay, this has not been in the minds of people, you got to realize, until 2000s, until 9-11 hit. Then they got received a lot of attention. Why is that? Okay, going back. Catastrophes are important to control people, correct? If they've been concocted or allowed so that they can have more pervasive control. And think about this. Catastrophes, in order for those to happen, you need enemies. Mm -hmm. All right? Enemies are important so that you can find someone to blame. Okay? How do you think Adolf Hitler took over? He needed an enemy. It's all those Jews' fault. See that? That's why he was able to have power control and then the, the horrible Holocaust happened. But it's globalist versus globalist. So the United, uh, so then the United States of America and Europe, for they are now the thriving economy because they're the winners out of World War II. See that? So then who was their enemy? Hitler. See that? An enemy is important. So then, if you're going to be a world nation, you've got to find some nation to blame. All right? Who's a good group that you can find, you think, during 90s, 2000s? This bunch, all right? This is a good bunch to target. The reason why is because their history, they are known for their history, they are known for their religion to be full of terrorism, hate, killing people. And if you don't think so, then you're, uh, here's an eye-opening thing. This civilization you live in, remember, are the, uh, who are the ones on this uh, uphill uh, during that time. It's a Western civilization, correct? Those were the winners of World War II. You have to realize that. So it's in their culture that you're living under. Do you understand what I'm telling you? All right. So uh, those who joined United Nations, the winners of World War II, they're the ones who can go on this uphill. Why? Because they're the winners that came out of World War II, all right? Any kingdom who takes advantage of catastrophes and come out the winners, they'll have a prosperous civilization. And they rewrite the history books. Okay. Okay. Even uh, when I was in liberal colleges, they even admit that too. They even admitted that history, yeah, winners are the ones who write our history. Even liberal professors will admit that their history, that there are faults to it. They'll even admit that because they say winners are the ones who dictate and rewrite all the history. So think about this, all right? So you're in the winner's history, all right? 
what they've taught you, okay? So this kind of religion is within the lens, sorry, of the United Nations culture, not their culture. If you go to their culture, if you go to their nation, you're going to change your mind. If you at least live as a missionary over there for at least one month, but no, you're too comfortable settled in your Western culture, right? So you'll always remain in a Western mentality. And I thought liberal schools taught you that we've all been brainwashed by a Western mentality, right? Hypocrites, you know what they're talking, you know that? But there is a truth to their statement is that we're all brainwashed in a Western culture mentality. But you got to join their culture and then your eyes get open. So this group, the nations who practice the religion and then violence comes out of it, that's a good bunch to blame. You have to find a group of people to blame, okay, if you're going to come out again because it's going downhill again. 9-11 hit, right? But then Bush, he was able to win the presidency that liberal professors are whining and complaining. He wouldn't have become president if it weren't for events surrounding 9-11 or stuff like that. How about that? How about that, what they said? Showing right here that these catastrophes were important to gain power and advantage again for certain elites. Okay, so it's going on a decline again. Catastrophe, see that? Now, <clears throat> I would recommend uh, William Grady's book. But William Grady's book, he has uh, a chapter on the Oklahoma City bombings. Then he has another uh, uh, chapter uh, where it talks about 9-11. Then he briefly indicates Waco. I mentioned this before, but go to Joel Tillis's channel, The Soul Trap, he talks about Waco. Now think about this, okay? When you study all these catastrophes, it's very strange. It's exactly like World War II. Basically, the, the main story, what your government told you on how these catastrophes occurred, did not line up or make sense. When you study about Pearl Harbor, when you study about what happened in Waco, 9-11, uh, Oklahoma City bombings. Now, I'm not going to give all the documentations and story on this one because I'm simply going through history, but I'm giving you my source. I recommend William Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God, and then Joel Tillis' uh, episode concerning Waco. If you read those two chapters with, from Grady's book about Oklahoma City bombings and 9-11, and then Tillis' stuff, it's strange, but the government, what they told you how the catastrophe occurred does not jive, it doesn't fit well, all right? It's very weird stuff. And our government always had a history of doing that. Even liberal professors will admit it. I've been to those classes. They say CIA lie all the time, I heard one professor say. They say the government lies all the time, you know? But then these people, they... <laughs> They don't faithfully uh, practice what they preach, right? It's very weird. But they lie all the time. One thing you do know is lesson one, okay, out of this, lesson one, I'm pretty sure you can all agree with me by now, you can't really believe the mainstream news or the mainstream story or the mainstream narrative of what you've heard from your typical government. All right, I think we can all agree with that, whether you're Democrat Republican, left wing, or right wing. Everyone has a level of mistrust for our system. Okay? We can all agree with that much. Secondly, it's an indisputable fact throughout history because of catastrophes, certain elites, whether they be Republican or Democrat, left wing or right wing, because of certain catastrophes, certain elites were able to take advantage and it was used for their benefit to gain more control or power. That's indisputable. So that's the second factor to consider. Third factor to consider is this. When you actually study the details of what happened, and then I gave you my sources, Grady and Tillis' stuff, if you actually read and pay attention, the government had the power. The government had the resources. 
They were warned and told several times. I mean, they could have avoided this. But either, base, best case scenario, they were negligent. And you know what happens in court, right? They even penalize negligence, okay? Even if you even if you did it with best intentions, all right? So at best, they were very sloppy at their job when they shouldn't be. You were the stinking United States of America for crying out loud, man. Like everything, they, are, they have control, they can keep track of everything, man. I mean, how many intelligence agencies you need if one is not good enough? We much, might as well fill up the whole alphabet list, you know, of acronym names for intelligence agencies. That's how many we got, all right? So you gotta realize this, we got all the power and asset, okay? So best case scenario, they were very sloppy and they still should be blamed, penalized for it. Or two, worst case scenario, they deliberately let something happen. That's important to, con uh, to think about with these catastrophes ever since World War II with these things, okay? So with Waco, Oklahoma City bombings and 9-11. So here's a, another thing to consider. It's interesting with each of these catastrophes, it's like you need someone to blame. You notice that? You notice that? Within these catastrophes, it's important you need someone to blame. The evidence is even right now, all right? Who's to blame for the economy falling apart, right? So then Democrats will blame on Republicans or Trump. Republicans will blame it on the current president or the Democrats. Yeah. See that? It's important that you need someone to blame. Yeah. It's important that you need an enemy. If a catastrophe cannot go on an elite, you need someone. See that? And it's strange when you read uh, those sources that I gave to you, these people have just been conveniently found to be used to blame or they had previous connections or communications with our government. Yeah. The people who are responsible for these catastrophes. Here's another thing from William Grady's book. You know uh, what's very interesting about previous communications with government, with some of these enemies who caused these catastrophes? They, they were uh, Arabs or people who had Muslim connections. That's weird, right? Yeah. Why? Because you need to pick a group of people that you can blame easily, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah. See, that? that's, easy. that's a group of people that's easy to blame. So I'm not going to go through every detail and explain to you. This is a history lesson, not proving the event, uh, how it occurred, was done by so-and-so, right? But these sources read it. There is no doubt you, those points that I gave to you are indisputable, all right? And that it's very weird how uh, the government had previous connections to some of these guys. All right? It is as if something was planned or they overlooked that person that they should have kept eyes on. It's just very weird, all right? So then, basically, because of those guys, now they found a new group where they can blame, all right? So let's get down to some of the interesting notes concerning uh, this group of people here, all right? So uh, this religion, like I told you, is a religion uh, from hell. It is wicked, it is evil. Uh, they promote violence, terrorism. Find groups who act violent or terror terrorist, whether religious or non-religious, it don't matter. If you're a, a person who wants to find someone to blame, you're gonna pick that group whether religious or non-religious. Just so happened they were the most convenient. Okay? So whoever's the most convenient, they're going to pick them. That's important to understand. That's why they were targeted for that one. So why is it easy to pick them? So let's talk about this religion, which is very important. It's been very ignored throughout history until we hit 2000, see? All right. Um, as I've taught you before, they have a huge play with the Antichrist religion in the coming future. There is absolutely no doubt about it. I'm going to show you how they play a part with the Antichrist or the devil system, while the, why they're important throughout our past history and the future, all right? So let's give the full scope right here. 
This one is from uh, David Earl Johnson's book. I would highly recommend it. It's called The Ultimate Reich, page 67. All right, I had the privilege to actually see him speak at Dr. Upton's church. But he's very crucial for understanding our modern history, how we end up here. He mentions this. The first problem is that we have been taught to believe that Islam is a religion. In fact, I have so frequently heard the phrase, one of the three great religions, that I want to cry out in anger because it is simply not true, at least in terms of religion, which teaches love for God first and our fellow man second. Each of the three so-called religions to which the phrase refers seeks to multiply itself in one way or another. The greatest distinction with the Islamists, all right, is the complete indifference to human life and suffering. Here's what he says on page 67. Judaism does what it can to keep the religion alive within the Jewish family, teaching that children should marry other Jews. Actually, I should be showing the quote. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yay, finally, you get to read documentations, right? Rather than thinking I'm making stuff up. All right, here we go. All right, read along with me. I'm at the bottom box right here, Judaism, all right? Judaism does what it can to keep the religion alive within the Jewish family, teaching that children should marry other Jews and teach their children to fear and love the God of the Bible. Judaism does not actively seek converts. In fact, it is customary for a rabbi to refuse conversion to an applicant three times before finally giving in and embarking upon a course of teaching about Jewish beliefs. The rabbis are reluctant to accept converts for a number of reasons. One is that they have been accused in the past of coercing people to convert. Another is that they are afraid that having once converted, a person might recant because he did not really understand what it means to be a Jew. So Judaism, rather than growing by leaps and bounds, is in fact shrinking around the world. Okay, that's important to understand. So Jewish is shrinking. Islam on the other hand, is the fastest growing religion around the world. And it is the only religion that calls upon its followers to kill infidels who refuse to convert and to kill Muslims who convert to another religion, all based on the teachings of the Quran. But the confusing thing about the Quran is that it has many pleasant verses teaching its followers to love everybody, coupled with other verses that incite violence. The greatest problem is that our leaders, wanting desperately to be liked, have chosen to believe that most Muslims do not believe the bad parts of the Quran and that only Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, and occasionally Gaddafi Gaddafi believe and act upon the violent verses. The truth is that all dedicated, dedicated, see that's the thing, if you're dedicated, Muslims believe them and will, if pushed, act upon them. So if they really believe that Quran, believe every verse, memorize that thing wholeheartedly, practice it faithfully, believe it literally as it says and etc., it's one of the most dangerous religions in the world, you have to realize. But then, see, if you put a Western culture mentality in there through their scholars, right? See, you can maintain that peaceable thing, and then I'll cover that part. All right, this is pretty interesting, this split, okay? Islam is not a, just a religion. It is a political movement determined to take over the whole world. And it is doing a pretty good job of it. One in every five people in the world is now a Muslim. This worldwide conspiracy started in Saudi Arabia 1,400 years ago and so far has forcibly taken over some 60 countries, including some of the largest in the world. Now, I'm reading him from early 2000s. We're now in 23, so a lot can change after that, all right? A lot can change after that. But I'm covering history from 2000s, remember, 90s and 2000s, okay? So that's the part of history I'm covering. But it's important why that religion was important that time period, okay? 90s, 2000s. So that's why I'm reading this. Uh, This worldwide conspiracy started in Saudi Arabia 1,400 years ago, and so far it has forcibly taken over some 60 countries, including some of the largest in the world. In Europe, Islam is now the second largest religion after Christianity, 
The motto of the Islamists is, quote, first the Jews, then the Christians, end of quote. Yes, they are planning to come after the Christians after they finish with the Jews. They have made fearful inroads into the United States as 9-11 has shown us. The question is not, will they be able to, to destroy America, but when will they be able to destroy America? Now, this is very important to understand. I want to show you a difference here. Islam is growing fast. Judaism is shrinking. There are Christians leaving churches. That is growing too. Do you see something here? What's going on? What do you think is going to happen at the tribulation then? God's people are going to be outnumbered by the devil's people. You think about that? All right, I showed you a passage last time, right? Uh, we'll go over there right now, all right? But Revelation 20, Revelation 20. How do you die in the tribulation? Come on. Strange, right? I mean, this is too... Uh, I mean, Western culture wouldn't do something, something like this, right? Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were what? Beheaded for the witness of Jesus. How about that? They were uh, killed by a sword. As, as a matter of fact, if you go to Revelation 13, notice right here, killed by the sword. Revelation 13. Revelation 13, 10. Revelation 13, 10. The Bible says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's a patience in the faith of the saints. Oh, that's so outdated. Why, why would they kill with the sword? But which group actually still practice that? And there have been so many... I mean, you got to realize that uh, it was so messed up that it was uploaded on YouTube before YouTube had its censorship AI thing running. But there were so many videos of those things. Uh, basically, people cutting off the head, you know, and then they always target right there in the hands and all that kind of stuff. What religion teaches that? Okay, think about this. Use your head now. Which group has been used by the elites? to do their bidding, and had previous communications with the government, okay? The elites, right? So this Western elite is using this bunch to do their bidding. You see that right there? Revelation 13 and 20 shows you that the world government under the Antichrist will use a certain bunch of people to do their executions for them. Do you see that there? How about that? How about that? So think about this. Is why do you think throughout our previous modern history they've been using them or they find it convenient to target them where it can be used for their advantage? Why do you think that's important unless in the tribulation that will be important? You, gotta pay, you know why you have to pay attention to our modern history, to our current events? It's very important because you're going to see what's going to happen in the future. Amen. All right? That's the reason why it's very important to know your history because you want to know your future right. where you're headed toward. The greatest evidence is even what liberals recognize as a very renowned authority is Yuval Noah Harari. He majors history. Liberals love that guy. They use that guy, you know. He'd probably make him the Antichrist if they wanted to, you know. They love that guy so much. But that guy predicted a lot of things about the future. You know why? Because he majored in history. You know why Dr. Upman was able to prophesy a lot of things that people thought that he was crazy on, but then once we hit 2020, then we're like, whoa, yeah. that guy was, you know why? He, yes, he, I think his first major or his doctorate was church history. That was a specialty. Because he studied that thing, he predicted the future. He could see what's going to happen. History is so important, guys. That way you can see where we're headed toward, all right? Why? 
Why is this happening to us, all right? It's not coincidence. It's not random. It's just not chance. Things like this happen, and then it's going to play out something in the future, you have to realize. All right. Now, continuing on, I go back uh, to them here. Read text. All right. Page 71. This is talking about Muhammad. To keep his followers from having any time to think of anything besides his religion, Muhammad gave them a set of laws and each was told to watch his brother to be sure he did not stray. Those who did stray even slightly paid the ultimate price. Among the laws were the following. Page 72. Each believer must pray five times a day facing Mecca. The prayers included not just words, but actions such as kneeling, standing, and lying prostrated. The adherents were lined up in orderly rows, which kept them in the for formation of an army. The believer must state, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. He must go to the mosque on Friday to pray and hear a sermon. In Islam, the man is supreme ruler of his household. His wife is his property and has absolutely no rights. In Islam, all laws are very strictly observed and punishment is severe and fast. A thief has his hand cut off. More serious crimes, including insults to Islam, deserve death by decapitation. Now, do you see this cutting off thing of hand and head? Where does the mark of the beast go? Hand and head. So they're, they're very convenient people to use then. If I'm an elite... That'd be a good bunch to conveniently use. All right. You, you think I'm going to use a bunch of uh, liberals and uh, sissies who, who can't do that nowadays in college campuses? They won't do that. Come on. They won't do that. You, it's just common sense, all right? Use your head. You're not using your head. If you're a ruler of a world, if you're a king in a kingdom, and then you want to conveniently conveniently use someone to do your bidding, especially to do something like that that the Bible prophesied, which group are you going to pick? Use your head. Christians? All right, continuing on. You may remember the beheading of a Saudi princess that was shown on TV around the world a few years ago. No, because we've been, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know that. We're too much in our Western comfort zone. We think we're on an uphill, that prosperity, and we're not paying attention, see? But the government, who has eyes everywhere, they pay attention. Yeah. They know certain events and which things to use. All right. This is not a matter of race, color, or religion. It is a matter of facing the facts. It has been said that a nation that does not learn from history is doomed to repeat it. Told you so. I invite you to remember the 1930s and Chamberlain's visit to Hitler in Munich. All right, here's interesting, all right? Chamberlain, the British prime minister, came back with the good news of peace in our time. A short time later, we embarked upon the worst war that the world has ever seen, which we know as World War II. In the Miami Herald of June 7, 2002, uh, Julian uh, Schwindler man, <laughs> tells of the Islamic adoration of Nazism. When was the last time they taught you that, right? As Hitler took power in 1933, he received congratulations from, Mary, from many Arab capitals. Didn't you know that? They didn't tell you that in history class, did they? In 1937, Joseph Goebbels praised the Arab national and racial conscience. Many Arab homes in Palestine proudly displayed swastikas and portraits of Hitler. Pro-German groups sprang up in Syria, Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt. A popular song in late 30s, Egypt contained the words, No more monsieur, no more mister, in heaven, Allah, on earth, Hitler. So look at that. I mean, Islam, I mean, if Hitler was the Antichrist, if, he, if the Lord used him as the Antichrist, Islam could, could have paved the way. Could have been that religion that uh, helped out the Antichrist. You don't think that history won't repeat itself when the real Antichrist comes? All right. And Hitler was named Hitler Abu Ali. Oh, isn't that nice, you know? After the war, after the war Hitler was still worshipped by the Islamists. In 1962, 
Adolf Eichmann, having been executed in Israel as a murderer of three million Jews, was venerated as a martyr in the Jordanian newspaper Al Ra'ai for exterminating members of the, quote, race of dogs and monkeys. They don't teach you that. It's always white Protestant Christians that have always been racist and hateful people. If you study every historical timeline, no matter what nationality you came from, everybody was a racist and everybody was hateful. Yeah. But an elitist wanted to pick the most convenient bunch. You got to realize that. So think about this, all right? Just, just a side note, all right? All right? If you're, let me use Christians, all right, if you feel uneasy about me using these people. So think about a certain stupid bunch of Christians who are labeled hate group, and then they are talking about, you know, oh, I, I just wish that all homosexuals died and stuff like that. Why did they receive so much publicity? Why were they very popular online during that time? Why is it that uh, unless, kind of like this bunch here, they're a convenient group of people to use where people can find someone to blame? You see what I mean? So it's not a matter of being Muslim or Christian. That's not the bottom line. The point is, which group is the most convenient to use during that historical time period or that event that I want to use to put as a blame? Hitler, it was Jews. During 2000, it was that religion there, Islam. And then today, it's these uh, weirdo online Christian groupies who are weird little cult members. All right, yeah. you go home and pray about that for a while, all right? Now, let me keep reading here, page 73. A Saudi periodical saluted him for his courage and the leading Lebanese newspaper lamented that he had not killed more Jews. <laughs> can you believe that? Now, look, I'm reading from history here, guys, all right? Here, here, here's a thing, and then you can look it up. If you doubt me and if you doubt what you're reading, just simply type down some of these words or their names or the dates, and then you do the research yourself, all right, instead of feeling uneasy and getting offended, all right? Right. You got to research, then you'll see it for yourself. In 1965, a Moroccan commentator wrote, quote, a Hitlerian myth is being cultivated on a popular level. Hitler's massacre of the Jews is eulogized. It is even believed that he did not die. His arrival is longed for, end of quote. In 2001, an Egyptian newspaper columnist in the government daily, Al-Akbar writes, quote, thank you, Hitler, of blessed memory, <clears throat> who on behalf of the Palestinians avenged in advance against the most vile criminals on earth. Could you believe that? Two months later, Egypt's press syndicate awarded this writer its highest distinction. <laughs> wow. A poll conducted among Palestinians in June 2002 and reported by Reuters shows that a majority of Palestinians believe that the aim of their 20th month old uprising should be to eliminate Israel and not just end Israeli occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. 79% of people surveyed said that they backed the revolt in some way and 68% said that they approved of suicide bombing against Israeli civilians. George Bush's statement of September 12, 2001, quote, Islam means peace, end of quote. And the later statements of his cabinet and the leaders of our government show that they have virtually no concept of what Islam really is. In fact, very few people in the United States know much about Islam. The fact is that you can always trust a Muslim to be a Muslim. It is part of the Muslim's tradition and lifestyle to lie they believe that anything they do to further the cause of Islam is right and good. Anything covers everything from corruption and lying to murder and slavery. Therefore, anything they say to placate George Bush and other Western leaders is an acceptable lie. This is why the Oslo Agreement didn't work. They said one thing to is, uh, Israel and the West and exactly the opposite to their own people. One very important verse in the Quran tells a Muslim never to become friends with the unbeliever. 
Therefore, when the crown prince of Saudi Arabia visits George Bush on his farm in Crawford, Texas, George says they were cementing a relationship. And the prince says that the cause of Allah was furthered, quote, because the fool believed me, <laughs> end of quote. Speaking of his meeting at the Crawford Ranch with Crown Prince Abdullah in April 2002, President Bush says, quote, one of the really positive things out of this meeting is the fact that, Crown Prince, that the Crown Prince and I established a strong personal bond. We spent a long time alone discussing our respective visions, talking about our families. There is a shared vision. The President said, adding that they discussed possible next steps in implementing a Saudi peace plan championed by Abdullah and endorsed by the 22-member Arab League. The crown prince, who rarely comments to the media, left without speaking to reporters. Bush said that his demand that Israel withdraws from Palestinian area still stands. Quote, the Saudi leader made it clear that they will not use oil as a weapon, and I appreciate that, respect that, and expect that to be the case, end of quote, Bush said. Here is obviously just one more case of the Saudi crown prince making demands and pres President Bush kowtowing. Anything that is said under such circumstances must be examined in light of the words of the Quran. Islamic tradition and recent history. The Quran, okay, not Western tradition. Right. Not Western schools teaching what Muslims should practice and believe in. Come on. And that's why Muslims who are adapting to the Western culture are doing that. All right? You got to open your eyes on that one. All right? You got to really open your eyes on that one. People don't do that. So I'm not talking about uh, Muslims who are following the Western culture here, see, who are adapting the uh, Western culture, that we go around visitation. Some of the nicest people, more than Christians, could be those Muslims, you know that, in visitation? But I'm not talking about those kind of people who have been what? Who have been uh, programmed, who are following the Western culture. They're not really, you got to realize this, they're not really dedicated Muslims. That's right. And I don't care how many times they pray That's right. or how religiously they live. According to their book, according to their tradition and everything, if they really follow those principles, all right, it is full of violence and hatred. It is, it is utmost disgusting. Right. And, if you, and if you think that what I said is extreme, don't make me pull up Quran verses on you. Yes, yes. Yep. Their second most uh, holy writings, all right, the Hadith and other stuff is, is much worse. That's right. All right, and these are from their scholars they respect. And these are fresh not from Western culture or Western educated schools. These are fresh from Muslim cultures, Muslim religions. All right, those nations. All right, that's real Islam there, buddy. Not liberal Western schools. That's their distorted version of Islam. Do you believe their distorted version of Christianity in liberal schools? Come on, that's good. You guys are on crack, man. Every, everyone's on crack nowadays. All right. The Quran clearly states that a Muslim may not have friends among unbelievers. Therefore, Bush's strong personal bond shared respective visions, and folks who talk about their families were all one sided observations. No wonder the crown prince left without making a comment. Our president acquiesced, appeased, and groveled his way through a state visit from his master. The crown prince doubtless went his way to report victory over the gullible United States in everything that mattered. The matter of using oil as a weapon can wait until the time. You to use it comes, and when that time comes, he will pat George on the head and tell him to shut up. The Saudi Arabian ambassador to Britain recently published a poem praising the Palestinian suicide bombers, and the Saudi government sponsored a telethon that collected $100 million to help the families of the bombers and to continue funding for the Hamas terrorist organization. When did you hear that from CNN, huh? George Bush is not the first American president to be fooled by the Saudis and the other Islamic states. In 1995, the American intelligence community was hot on the trail of a Saudi global money laundering operation that raised millions of dollars for terrorism. The Clinton administration shut down the investigation on orders from the Saudi government. One of the main targets of that probe and one of the most foremost collectors of funds for terrorism in the United States was Sami al Aryan, a University of South Florida professor. Oh, Florida, a godly state that everybody wants to migrate to because it's still a Christian state, obviously. It is interesting to note that this is 2000s, guys. All right? 
It is interesting to note that the same terrorist uh, front man is considered by George W. Bush to be his very good friend, quote. And Mr. Bush, to my knowledge, has never severed his ties to his friend, Sami. It is also interesting to note that the investigation was restarted after U.S. intelligence authorities heard that Indian intelligence had wiretapped the telephone of a Pakistani charity funded by the Saudi government and discovered that $100,000 had been transferred to Mohammed Atta, one of the foremost September 11th terrorists. According to documents found by Israeli forces in Palestinian offices recently, Saudi Arabia paid some $5,000 to each of the families of 102 terrorists killed in attacks on Israel, with some of the payments coming after September 11, when our president thought the Saudis were our partners in the war against terrorism. Mr. Bush seems to be making a habit of meeting with Islamic world leaders in the mistaken belief that they are coming to talk peace. Nothing could be further from the truth. They have found in him a gullible believer in all their uh, pretenses of peace. As a matter of fact, even Bush admitted in front of liberal news media and even liberal professors and everybody admitted that the big mistake that Bush did was at war. He did. Because he thinks that he could achieve peace that way. Even liberals admit that too. Why? Because of their culture, their religion. Not because, oh, these people are just insane and they don't know what they're talking about. No, they're rational they're thinking people, all right? It's because of what their movement, their culture, their religion is, what they're grown up to be. Hosni Mubarak, president of Egypt, likes to show himself in the West as a moderate Arab leader, yet his government-sanctioned newspaper Al-Akbar recently regretted that Hitler had not finished wiping out all of the Jews. The article was headed, quote, if only you had done it, brother. That was a title, wow. The article also encompasses the ridiculous proposition that the Holocaust never happened. <laughs> if you're going to tell a lie, make sure it's a big one. If you tell it often enough, people will believe it. Al Jazeera, the official Saudi Arabian daily, recently offered an article by Dr. Khalil Ibrahim uh, al Sadat praising the bomber of the Passover massacre. Yet our president still, believes, uh, still seems to believe that his princely friend came to offer peace to Israel and the United States. Another of Mr. Bush's apparent partners for peace is Syria's Bashar Assad. His government justifies the murder of innocent Israelis by saying that it is because Israel has killed innocent children, mothers, and the elderly among Palestinians. With all this rhetoric, it is sometimes difficult to remember that the Israeli army has been... <clears throat> forced to retaliate against relentless terrorism, and that that retaliation has occasionally resulted in the deaths of some women and children. The difference is that while the Israelis occasionally accidentally killed some innocent people, the Palestinian Islamists have deliberately killed innocent Israeli men, women, and children. The Star Telegram of April 6, 2002 carries an assist news service article entitled The Crescent Moon in the Classroom. It claims that a large number of California public school students are being required to take a crash course in pro-Islam studies. Oh yeah, obviously California. This was 2002, guys. I, God knows what they teach now in that class, right? They deny who you are now. They teach you to deny who you are in the class. That's how insane it is, okay? <clears throat> the course mandates that seventh graders learn the tenets of Islam, memorize verses of the Quran, and learn to pray in the name of Allah. But, it, you know, doing Jesus and all that is, what, ban? It's not allowed? What in the world? They are instructed to chant, praise to Allah, Lord of creation. Nobody can say that California is slow in introducing everything new, whether in clothing, politics, or religion. But surely this excursion into Islam is going a few steps too far in light of the death and destruction of September 11th. All right, so that's where our world has headed toward. So that's why you can see why this, uh, why this group is easy to pick out, okay? And you can also see why the devil would want to pick out this religion too, all right? It will fulfill a lot of what he's doing. So we've seen throughout past history, it's not Islam that's the most guilty religion. You remember what it was, right? It's Catholicism, right. all right? They're the ones to blame all this time. The Muslims had no part in that time. All right? Not really used by the devil. But it's not until this time they can be used now. 
Why? Because the Catholics, they've taken over all the elite's organization now, the Western culture. All right? They're all over now in America and Europe. They're the winners, remember, of World War II. Okay? So they've taken over everything. Okay? That's the largest religion for United Nations, pretty much, or the most powerful, if not the largest. It's the most powerful that take over powerful offices and positions. This is the fastest growing religion. So who are you going to use then? Use your head, okay? Especially with a teaching and a religion like that. That's going to be very convenient for the devil and the Antichrist to use when all six seals of revelation are unleashed here. Okay, let me wrap it up, all right? I'm done here. Okay, so I got to wrap it up with this, okay? I think I'll cover this part later, okay? Uh, I will briefly maybe cover this next time, but let me say briefly this part, what, what, what's important for here. So we get raptured, right? So this decline has to decline further, right? You have to have more catastrophe to have more control. That's how the Antichrist can control the world. What you're going through is not bad enough, guys. All right? So it's going to get worse. <clears throat> Thank God we'll be raptured before the tribulation. But at that tribulation, that's the worst it can get. Now think about this. These historical events are important to pave the way for the tribulation, correct? So here's something important to think about. To see what's going to happen in our future in the church, it's important to see these six seals in Revelation. All right? These are actual historical events that will occur in the future in the tribulation. But for them to come out, it don't naturally, when you study past 6,000 years of human history, events don't just, big events don't just come out like that. There are stuff set up it, that pave the way, that produce those big major events, you have to understand. Okay? That's very important. That's inevitable when you study history. So if you're going to get big events like these six seals, it's important that little pieces are in play during this time. That way you can pave the way for this full-blown. So let me go through this very briefly. All right? Think about this. All right? So just think about your current times, your history. All right? So then the first seal is that uh, the, uh, you get the Antichrist who's ruling all over the world, correct? All right, so it's important to have more of a centralized government control. That's very crucial. And to conquer people who speak out against it. Have you seen that with censorship today? Have you seen that where people tried to do uh, their protest, but they've been shunned out? And they've got, like, capital punishment on some things, pretty much. Isn't that insane? All right? When you look at the liberal protests, you know, you could do some comparisons, all right? But anyway, so centralized control. Number two, you need war. And the war there is interesting. Uh, in our history, Russia is not done. Communists are not done. They were central in our history. If it's a red horse and it matched the communists, they're important in the future. If that sword from the red horseman, that sword, can go with Islam, they're important in the future. Basically, rogue nations that don't follow the world nations, all right, that the Antichrist will use, rogue nations will occur in the future, which have been happening all this time. All right, communist uh, Soviet Union and United States of America or United Nations have always been in competition. Then when USR, SSR fell, then it was China and North Korea and then Cuba. But then now you got Putin and then Russia is back into play again and they're friendly with China. See, these rogue nations, they will continue. All right, so keep an eye on those. Rogue nations, whether it be communist, Islam, it don't matter. The point is there is a rogue nations that will go against United Nations. Keep your eyes peeled. Fourth, uh, third seal, you need the economic downfall. You had, we had the recession during Obama's era. When we went through 2020, we really hit hard. Economic downfalls must occur, that means still. All right, we'll get our moments of prosperity because every, uh, every uh, catastrophe has its prosperity, so you, it's going to go like this. But you're going to hit big, all right? You're going to hit big real soon. 
poverty is a huge thing that they're trying to fight against still too. Uh, fourth thing is disease. Oh, isn't that strange what we had? Uh, people claim they're trying to find a cure for cancer and stuff like that. And then other people have claimed that there have been cures, but they didn't really yes. tell you, yes. okay? So whether it be true or not, I'm not saying it's true or not, but the point is this. The point is, is that see, these diseases are very concentrated upon in our world. The Bible, so keep your eyes peeled. Those diseases must continue, that means. They can't be cured. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not going to get real cures, Diseases must continue, or at least new diseases must come out. Fifth one right here. Uh, that's the fourth horseman. Fifth one, you need a target to blame. You need enemies to blame. We see that the Jews, they're on the decline. They're going to be the convenient target again. Who, uh, there are two groups who have now been picked upon by liberal mainstream news now, and those are the Christians and then the nation of Israel. So those two groups have been heavily concentrated on. So keep your eyes peeled on that, okay? Obviously, Christians will not go through the tribulation, but there will be saved people during the tribulation, see? So they're going to target them. Sixth one is, uh, the sixth seal, is that all of nature and creation falls apart when Jesus comes. What's the big topic everyone wants to talk about? Global warming, climate change. You know what the Bible demands? All of creation will fall apart at the tribulation. So notice that these major crucial historical events currently from 90s to 2000s match with six seals of Revelation. That's why I had to do that. That is part of our history, guys. All right, I'm going to explain more at our next history class. All right, it's going to be interesting. All right, it's going to be very interesting where we come from and everything. Father God, I pray that today's uh, Bible study has been a blessing to the people, opened our eyes on where we come from, where we're heading towards, and what's going on right now. What's stinking going on right now, Lord? The people are just so blind, Lord, and they're, in this, they're still blinded by that uphill, that prosperity, that life, that peace, and they're just so blind to everything what's going on around them. In this Western comfort set, we're trying to find any leftover to enjoy, but it is running out, God, and we know it. Lord God, it's, go it's going to have a heavy price one day. And we're seeing it, but we just pretend it's not there. We ignore it. We want to live whatever leftover years we can in the world. The devil has sure blinded our eyes, Father. I pray that we won't be blinded to the devil's machine. The devil's machine that uh, every robot is living under. Every human is acting like a robot living under. Open our eyes, Fathers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.